I'm here with Hall of Famer Mike Piazza. Mike, great to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me, man. So let's talk a little bit about baseball and business, because you know a lot about both. Yeah. And obviously people talk about the relationship between baseball and business. In your mind, how are they similar? How are they different? Well, I mean, I think the expression or the cliche was like baseball is a metaphor for life. And obviously, as you said, that can translate also into business. Uh, I think the importance of teamwork, the importance of um, different parts and different people getting together to have a common goal, a common agenda, and that is obviously in baseball is to win. In business, obviously, is to, to build a successful business, to, to build profits. To, to increase efficiency, to deliver your product to, to your customers efficiently. And um, what I found is that to really have a successful team, you have to have everyone knowing their role. You have to have every, everyone have a support and support each other. And uh, you can't have, uh, we talked about Tommy a little earlier. I mean, Tommy, Tommy Lasorda. Tommy Lasorda mm -hmm. always has, a, has this expression saying that, um, if a team is working against itself, he said it's like tug of war. He said if you have one half of the team on one side of the rope and one half on the other right side of the rope, you're going to pull against each other all day and achieve nothing. Did you but ever see But if you get everyone in, in on the same, thing? yeah, well, if you get everyone on the same uh -huh. side of the rope, he goes, we'll pull all the other teams with us. Right. So these cliches and these expressions make a lot of sense in the business world as well. Right. You mentioned Tommy Lasorda, Mike. Who are some other people in the game that you learn from? sort of lessons and wisdom? Well, I've always stressed the importance of coaching and how it, it is very important to identify a coach that can get the most out of you, that maybe can see something in, in, a, in a prospect or, or maybe a manager or someone who can see a talent that just needs refining. And it's like coaches are basically diamond polishers you know you have to take the talent and refine it get them to believe in themselves and you know Reggie Smith who was a great player coming up with the Red Sox and the Dodgers and the Cardinals was a hitting was my first hitting coach and he had this unique ability to motivate me he had this unique ability to identify in me um, the talent that I had it always was in my corner and even when I had hard times with the, with the organization, and I was actually close to quitting the game, uh, he went to bat for me, pardon the pun, and said, look, this kid's got some great talent. You just got to stay with him and give him another chance. And fortunately, he did that. And fortunately, I was able to go on and have a great career. You were going to quit the game. You're a Hall of Famer. There was. It was in the minor leagues, and I was having a very difficult time, and I was frustrated. I wasn't playing a lot. I was having an injury plague season. And I just thought, look, I gave it a good shot, but now I got to go home and, you know, get in the real world and go to work. And Reggie's like, I'm not going to let you quit. He goes, I believe in you. You got talent. You got power. You have one thing. And he always said to the Dodgers, he goes, this kid has something you can't teach, and that's power. So uh, he talked me back. He said, hey, you got to stick it out. And so I'll always, always uh, treasure him and thank him for that. So you're a fan of Warren Buffett. Yeah. What do you like about Warren Buffett? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, aside from uh, he is a, as a brilliant investor, um, all these qualities that we talked about um, merging with the ability to see markets and see the need and see talent, see companies that are up and coming, see, see companies that have good teams and that are efficient, that are achieving things, that are, are um, proactive, not reactive. Um, and then having the capital to sort of make these strategic bets and the reason why he's so successful. Um, he would be, if you translate it, he would be a, a great baseball scout or a great baseball manager going back to baseball and how it relates. Um, and, you know, again, we've talked before. I'm sure he's had a few um, uh, tough things that didn't work out, as all investors do. And what do you do? You lick your wounds and you, and you identify the next target. And so uh, I think... It seems like the thing about him that he's always been able to sort of learn from the mistakes and get better and not make them again. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with the mistakes, but you have to learn from them. And um, you, 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 that knowledge that you acquire uh, becomes wisdom. 
You know, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. I mean, book smarts and then wisdom is putting it in practice in the real world. So um, just have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And obviously, being re unbelievably rich doesn't hurt as well. <laughs> Do you own any Berkshire Hathaway shares? Uh, I wish I had more. I mean, yeah. I've, I've been blessed to have good money managers. Uh, and I always say that's what... Um, it's always fun for me. I think as an investor, you have to have your safe space, so you know, pardon the pun, but you have to have your solids that are giving you a good residual return. But then you can have a little bit where you're making some strategic bets where you can, you know, maybe play with the ponies a little bit. Right. And that's what I kind of do, and that's sort of been my philosophy. I've had some, some, some failures, but I've also had some successes as well. If you own Berkshire, that's probably yeah. been a pretty good thing, right? <laughs> sure. So let me ask you a little bit about the game of baseball. Um, you know, and, and evolution, because the game, you could argue, hasn't changed that much. Some people want it to speed up and those kinds of things. What do you think about where the game stands right now, Mike? Well, I think it's been sort of reflective on society's attention span shrinking very quickly. Um, baseball's always been one of those sports that hasn't sort of been on the clock. I mean, equated, you know, it's funny how we date ourselves. Maybe you and I are dating ourselves, but you remember as a picnic, as a kid? Yeah. When you go to a picnic, you're not like, well, when's the picnic going to be over? No, you just go there on a Saturday or Sunday, and you bring a basket with some sandwiches, and you're playing games. And it's like, you know, and that's the way baseball should be in a way. But unfortunately, I think our attention spans are so short today. And understandably, there's some things. You could always tweak the game and make it better in certain areas. But there's a certain cadence or a certain timing thing about the game for me that has to be enjoyable. You can't be in a hurry when you're at a baseball game. You go there and you have a hot dog or a beer and you watch the game and it unfolds and there's some downtime and then there's some really exciting times as well. So, um, you know, with that said, there's nothing wrong with doing, you know, making it uh, a little bit more efficient in areas, but ultimately that's what I love about baseball. It's one of the last sports that's not on the clock. What about sports betting, Mike? I mean, that's a controversial thing. It seems like it's coming gradually. Do you have a take on that? Interesting. Uh, yes, I look, I mean, betting all these vices, drinking, like for me, I like an occasional cigar. I'm a cigar smoker. I mean, everything, my dad, we had, we had a joke. He said, do everything in moderation, even moderation. <laughs> so, um, look, I think it really, if you are going to engage in betting or sports betting um, and it makes the game more interesting to you or a little more exciting, great. But obviously, there's a swing side where it becomes an obsession. And there's been a lot of people, like any vice, can become an addiction. So you have to really be able to have discipline and go, look, I'm going to put up 100 bucks or 200 bucks and bet it. And if I lose, I lose. I'm going to walk away and not go, like, I got to chase. I got to make it back. I got to make it back. And unfortunately, some people don't have that ability to stop it. So I guess in a roundabout way, it should be fun. You know, it shouldn't be this obsession. I know there's some professional you know, betters out there, uh, poker players and things like that, you know, leave it to the pros. Uh, right. But if it's something that you're not, I mean, afford and identify what can be fun for you and keep it that way and don't make it to where it's going to leverage or compromise, you know, your, your way of life. What about fantasy baseball? Do you follow that? And do, do players get into it? Or do you get into it? I never got into it, but I've always been. It's always been funny for me when when fans have come up to me and go, "You know, my fantasy team. You know, you better do well today." Or you know, it was it was something uh, emerging when I was. Uh, I've been retired a little while now, so obviously it's it's pretty huge. But I do remember a lot of guys coming up to me and saying, "Oh, you're on my fantasy team. Oh my God, you own a good deal. You better have a good year this year." So. Um, um, that's a little bit more intensive. You know, that's maybe like the Dungeons and Dragons crowd of, of sports, you know, where, you know, those guys in high school would wear <laughs> play Dungeons and Dragons. So, I mean, a little bit more intense for me, you know, a little bit more, uh, how would you say, uh, complicated. Um, I was never a, really a fantasy guy, even in football. And we used to have fa fantasy football leagues in baseball when the football season was starting. Oh, the players would have yeah, fantasy football. Yeah, exactly. They would have oh, drafts. Oh, because you didn't want to do it. About yeah, it was crazy. And then I would hear, like, you know, guys would have draft parties. and, and they the would baseball have, players. It's crazy. Yeah, huh. they would, I mean, they would love it. I mean, so, I mean, I was like, what do you guys, oh, we're going to the draft party. We're going to have, you know, guys are going to have beers and turn it into a draft. And I got this guy and that guy. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was funny. They Guys get into it. But not about baseball. The baseball no, players wouldn't do it. About, no, they'd do it. no, you could never do it right. on your own you sport. Your well, own sport. I mean, even if it was for fun, it right, really right, wouldn't right. make a lot of sense. Now, your dad, very successful business yeah. person. What did you learn from your dad, Mike? Uh, the quality of hard work, the quality of sacrifice, the quality of um, um, 
and I've said this before, and I love this expression. I mean, he, he outworked anybody and everybody, but you also have to have a little luck, too. And my dad was in the car business at a young age, and um, he was smart enough to understand that uh, in the early 70s, late 60s, Japanese cars were starting to come into the market, Honda and, at the time, Datsun. And he bought a Datsun new franchise, and nobody really heard of Datsun. It was just coming into the market now. It's Nissan, obviously. And then the 280Z or the 240Z came in, and he couldn't keep them on the lot. And then he bought a Honda store, and I remember he had always thought the cars at that time were obviously not American style. You know, they were smaller. They weren't the big Chryslers and Buicks and Fords and 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 uh, larger American cars. But the gas crisis hit in the 70s, and there was no gas. And the, obviously, the big gas guzzlers were, you know, obviously uh, became obsolete in so many ways. So everyone drifted towards the, the smaller, more fuel-efficient Japanese cars, and he was in the right place at the right time, and his, uh, you know, the business took off. Awesome. Last question. Astros Nationals, were you surprised that those two teams were in the World Series? No, I, I follow the uh, Astros. They've always, uh, for the last, uh, since they, uh, Bob Crane bought the team, and they, they em embarked on a very um, ambitious um, plan to to draft young guys and and um, change the the sort of philosophy of the, the culture of the team and um, they have a great farm system now they're well coached they're well managed um, obviously they have some great players uh, so no I mean I'm not uh, success is not an accident I mean success uh, it, it, it's a culture and you have to put the right people in the right place and have as I said everyone on the same page for a common goal and the Nationals were actually one of the best teams after, you know, the first few months of the season. So they have some some amazing pitching. Uh, you know, Scherzer getting hurt didn't help them. Anytime, uh, you know, one of your big guns like that goes down in the World Series, it's the worst time for it to happen. So, uh, you know, but tonight's game six, uh, you know, and if um, Strasburg can, can throw a gem, you're even again. It could be a game seven. I love game seven, so I'm not really have a – I don't have a dog in the fight, so I it's, a, you know – see but it was always fun to, to have a winner take all game Mike Piazza Hall of Famer great to see you my pleasure